Zara Phillips and Mike Tyndall, two elite sports people, but from very different worlds. Do you bow, do you curtsy, what on earth do you do? Zara, a royal wild child. She moves in with this boyfriend, has a tumultuous relationship, it's up and down like a yo-yo, on and off like a dodgy light bulb. And Mike Tyndall, a rugby-loving Yorkshireman. He's in his blood from an early age, started playing from the age of around seven. He was a regular lad. He was a bit of a joker. Their romance had intrigued the world. She's as down to earth and as normal as you possibly can be when you're born into one of the most dysfunctional and abnormal families in Britain. Would the prankster from the England team be able to curb his ways and toe the royal line? I'd have been much more surprised if she'd fallen for some titled aristocrat. A down-to-earth royal couple like no other. That Mike and Zara had vowed to make it a party to end all parties, and it certainly lived up to that billing. So have the royals' most unlikely couple succeeded where others have failed? They're accessible, they're down-to-earth, they're low-key, they live their own lives, they make their own decisions. Edinburgh, 30th of July, 2011. Zara Phillips ties the knot with former rugby union player Mike Tyndall. They looked incredibly happy, as everyone should on their wedding day. It was a very low-key affair, a, a, what you'd call, I guess, a, a traditional family wedding. Their wedding took place away from the spotlight. It was a far cry, perhaps, from Mike's humble beginnings and Zara's very privileged start in life. Zara was born on the 15th of May, 1981. Good evening. Princess Anne tonight gave birth to a baby girl, a sister for Peter, who's now three. And she's the Queen's first granddaughter. But whatever her name, she'll be sixth in line to the throne. From the outset, Zara would be different from the royals who had gone before. She was also the first granddaughter of a monarch to be born without a royal title. I think not having a title has really set Zara free, which is what her mother wanted. It means that she doesn't carry out any official royal duties. I mean, she's hardly royal at all. It's just a, a coincidence of birth, really. Despite Zara's lack of title, she was born a royal, and with that comes a bubble of wealth, pomp and public attention. Princess Anne wanted her children to have as normal an upbringing as she could give them. That meant shielding her from the pressures she was born into. Zara went to a local primary school. Her only royal head start was an introduction to the world of equestrianism. Horses are absolutely in Zara's DNA. If you cut her open, running through her like a stick of rock would be horses. Undoubtedly, she was sitting on ponies before she could walk. Ponies and horses are just part of her mother's life um, and her grandmother's life. 200 miles north in Yorkshire, Michael James Tyndall was born in the market town of Otley. His dad was a banker and his mum, Linda, was a social worker. Look back a little further in his family tree and there are dough masons, boot makers, weavers. Like Kate Middleton, his ancestry is resolutely working class. From an early age, Mike showed signs of enjoying sport and rugby was the favourite in his family. The Tyndall family have got a massive connection with Otley Rugby Club. Philip, is, uh, Mike's father, was captain there, and a lot of his uncles played for the club, and then his cousins as well. Mike's parents, Phil and Linda, worked hard to send their son to a private school, renowned for its rugby. Mike came into the senior school as an 11-year-old, and he was a very talented sportsman in a very talented year. When I was in charge of the under 12s, it was the first team he played for. Then I was coaching rugby and teaching him sport through the school. And his maths teacher, Mr Fitzsimons, remembers him well. Mike was quite a character. Um, he could be a bit cheeky sometimes, even a bit naughty. He would have called me Sir or Mr Fitz, or when he thought I wasn't listening, Fitzy. He was a regular lad. He was a bit of a joker. He used to tease me that I looked like Phil from EastEnders. I don't know if Mike would ever describe himself as a mathematician, but he used to work hard. It perhaps didn't come as easily to him as some of the other things he did in school. Aged just 13, Mike had his first encounter with royalty when the Queen attended his school to present a trophy. 
Mike was actually at the school when the Queen came to visit in 1991 as part of the 400 year old celebrations. But I very much doubt he would have expected to one day marry the Queen's granddaughter. Despite this brief introduction to the Queen, Mike was firmly focused on the sport he loved and becoming the best he could be. Mike was outstanding and I often found myself having to substitute him so that uh, we could give the other team the opportunity to, uh, to play a little bit of rugby. Well, the other lads recognised it. He was a big, powerful, strong athlete and a very good rugby player. I remember watching our first Twickenham final as a school in 1995 and he came on as a replacement. He was only in year 11 and quite quickly went on this confident run with the ball. And I think that summed him up really. He wasn't phased by the challenges that faced him, either in the maths classroom or on the rugby pitch. It was becoming clear Mike could go way further with his career and his talent than anyone could have dreamed of. He was snapped up by England schools, rugby, uh, which meant that he was whisked off to Australia for a seven-week tour. I mean, what 18-year-old wouldn't grab that chance? And he did with both hands. I mean, he excelled. When Mike was leaving school in 1997, rugby was just turning professional and he had the offer of a professional contract at Bath. He also had a place at university and he really wasn't sure what to do. I think I remember saying to him, well, what have you got to lose? You know, go and give it a go. You can always go to uni next year. While Mike was making waves on the rugby field, there were rumours of an emerging talent in the equestrian world. Looking after horses is hard work and Zara's experience gained at an early age had begun to pay off. In Pony Club, you don't just get to get on your horse, your pony, and enjoy the spoils of competitive glory. You have to be able to prove at every stage that you can do all of the work that's involved. You can't just have the glory of riding. So I think it really instilled a work ethic in Zara, which she maintains to this day. And I think that's what she got from her early life and probably very good for her. But it was only at Burley Horse Trials that people started to take her seriously. The Burley Horse Trials is a very big event in the equestrian world, and she came second in that in 2003. That was a big achievement. I think it, that was the moment where people really sat up and went, no, this girl is serious. There are very, very, very good professional riders in this sport who will spend their entire career looking for a second place at Burley, and she managed it. But Zara was struggling to keep her public and private lives separate. Royal rebel Zara Phillips is in trouble again after brawling with her boyfriend in public. Facing criticism for her wild child antics, Zara flew to Australia. The trip would transform her life. For most people, when they go on their gap year, they never think they're going to meet their future husband or wife. But for Zara Phillips, that stop off in Australia in 2003 changed her life forever. In the winter of 2003, Zara Tyndall fled from the prying eyes of the British media to Australia. In 2003, Zara was doing what a lot of women in their early 20s were doing, and she was on a gap year. A stormy four-year relationship with ex-partner Richard Johnson had caused both her and the royal family some difficult moments. Her relationship with her previous serious boyfriend, jockey Richard Johnson, was described as fiery and turbulent. There were suggestions that the couple sometimes were a bit overly physical with one another. Royal rebel Zara Phillips is in trouble again after brawling with her boyfriend in public. Jenny Bond has analyzed a 13-page spread of Hello! magazine, published in January 2002. Richard arranged with Hello! magazine a spread which was meant to be mostly about him, but of course when it came out there were pages of pictures and Zara was in nearly every one of them. Zara Phillips has been accused of being the latest royal to cash in on her status. She was cashing in on her royal connections. Her professional life was also on hold. Her horse Toy Town suffered an injury and she was unable to compete in the upcoming Olympics. It's hard to put into words, really, how strong the bond is between these riders and their horses. Day in and day out, these horses become your world. Heading to the other side of the world to escape, relax and reset seemed her only option. Already in Sydney, Australia, was Mike Tyndall, 
Now an England centre, he was at the pinnacle of his career and was playing in the Rugby World Cup. England were going great guns. They'd actually won in New Zealand for the first time since 1973. That gave the nation real hope that they could go back there to Australia and, and lift the World Cup. Mike was a huge part of that team. Mike had spent his entire career working towards this moment. But in a tactical move, the England manager reshuffled the squad and Mike was excluded. Mike had a, a massive setback when he was dropped for the semi-final. As a professional sportsman, it gets to be a horrible experience because, you know, if you, your team does go on and win, it's highly unlikely you'll be in the final itself, but you still want all your mates to do well. Joined by two teammates, Mike went to the exclusive Manly Wharf Bar in Sydney. Here, they could drown their sorrows. Zara was heading to the same bar with friends, planning to watch the rugby. And one evening, she walked into a bar, as you do, and who was there but Mike Tindall? Mike was probably quite sullenly drinking his way to the bottom of a pint glass, and Zara had been out with all her girlfriends having a lovely time. I don't think any sparks flew, but Mike remembers it fondly, saying, of course, she was absolutely stunning, but they didn't talk that much. It was only when Zara was leaving and asked mutual friend Austin Healy to give Mike her number that he realised she might want to meet again. And so it, it wasn't some great fairy tale meeting. They met in passing, they had some mutual friends. Uh, she knew some of his teammates. Any thought of romance had to be put to one side, as Mike had a job to do to play in the Rugby World Cup final. It's funny how all that happened in the same short space of time, getting Zara's phone number and the same time that he's drowning his sorrows after being dropped from the England semi-final. As a professional sportsman, I'm sure it would, might have not been the first thing on his mind. I think getting back in the team would have been paramount to him, but obviously that was something that was there in the background. Sydney, the 22nd of November, 2003, the day of the Rugby World Cup final. By the time the game began, an estimated 50,000 people were packed into the narrow streets of the Rocks, the former docks area of Sydney alone. Mike was back in the team. Uh, we were able to make contact with Mike a couple of days before and wish him well, but the whole school was certainly intent on watching. And the tension as we went into extra time. England won 2017. England to go on and win was absolutely brilliant and we were so pleased for the team and for Mike in particular as one of our own. Back in the UK, Mike and his teammates were welcomed as heroes. There must be millions of people here. Never ever thought I'd see this when England rode this team. It's a massive thank you for everybody who's here. Just absolutely brilliant. Thank you. That 2003 World Cup winning rugby team, they were gods when they came back, absolute gods. In a flash, Mike had gone from a fairly well-known sportsman to a huge British star. And so I think a lot of that stardust rubbed off actually on Mike and was an extra attraction for Zara. Mike now had a taste of the media scrutiny that Zara knew as a royal but his grassroots background helped him to take it all in his stride. Zara and Mike began a secret courtship, and royal observers were soon taking an interest. They're fiery people, and uh, they often have a great sense of humour. They're kind of people who work hard and play hard, and I think that's what uh, Mike and Zara had from the offset. I think they had fire in their bellies and fun in their hearts. There were rumours that Zara was keen for Mike to share her love of horses. She even persuaded him to get in the saddle. You'd need a fairly robust sort of horse, I think, to carry any sort of world-class rugby player, but <laughs> certainly in the very beginning of their relationship, I think Mike did take to the saddle a few times. And what I gather, Zara found him quite unteachable because he only wanted to gallop. So his riding career, I don't think, lasted particularly long. <laughs> The pair soon became inseparable. Never been surprised actually that, that Mike Tindall and Zara got together. I mean, he is a down-to-earth rugby Yorkshire lad. And I think that's exactly what Zara liked about him. What did he like about Zara? I mean, what is not to like about Zara? She's got a dirty sense of humour. She's incredibly good looking. She's game for a laugh. She'd probably drink him 
under the table. And I think Mike Tyndall was the kind of guy who absolutely loves all those qualities in a girl. The press were at every event, keen to capture a moment that confirmed Zara and Mike were an item. And it wasn't long before their first public kiss was caught on camera. Well, pictures of them quite often, obviously enjoying one another's company, in love, and I suppose breaking royal protocol, if you like. Um, they were kissing and cuddling. I think Zara's a very tactile person. With the pair settling into their romance, the biggest test for Mike would be meeting her family and winning the royal seal of approval. The royal family are historically enormously sporty people. Uh, they would have taken a huge interest in what he does for a living. I can't imagine that took the pressure off him for a moment. Anne had opted for a man from Civvy Street for her second marriage, so it was no surprise that she approved of down-to-earth Yorkshireman Mike. Next up was meeting the Queen. Do you bow, do you curtsy, what on earth do you do? But I think he was probably very well prepared and I expect he probably found it perhaps easier than he expected to. Mike was always a very laid-back character. Uh, whilst obviously very intense with his sport, he was a particularly, he took things in his stride and I think that's probably helped. I remember a conversation with Mike's mum and dad here in school. Mike was going out with Zara and they'd actually recently met Princess Anne and despite not knowing what to expect, they described her as being very down to earth and made them feel very at ease, which was lovely. Mike was soon approved by the sport-loving royal firm. If the royals are a horsey family first, it's fair to say they're a rugby family second. They're all very keen rugby supporters. Zara is a very keen rugby supporter and has been a patron and supporter of rugby. As the romance blossomed, commentators saw a change in Zara. Pre-2003, Zara had been kind of gossip magazine fodder, really. She was in and out of tabloid newspapers. So when she started going out clubbing in London, she's very good looking, very blonde. She commanded a lot of attention. Photographers wanted to take her pictures. She didn't really give two hoots about the press. She'd often kind of stick her fingers up or she'd be seen, you know, with a fag or a drink. She just didn't care. And so, of course, her reputation was that she was a really good time girl and she didn't really care who knew it. She was dubbed at one point the Royal Rebel because it was at um, Prince Charles's 50th birthday party, I think, that the press spotted that Zara had had her tongue pierced. And so, shock horror, it was all over the newspapers. I don't think her mother minded. By all accounts, her mother just said, well, I hope you can still eat, that's all. She just let her get on with it. Mike's work ethic seemed to be rubbing off on Zara as she headed back into her professional career. I think Mike helped get Zara back from that disappointment of not uh, being able to compete in the Olympics. He supported her very much in training hard and setting new goals for her. They were a great team right from the offset. It soon brought results. Zara's confidence is clear from this footage and she won the FEI World Equestrian Games in Aachen. Before their relationship started, Zara was already very much a successful athlete in her own right. She had a training system that she'd been crafting through the years. It can be an extraordinary partnership to have two high-performing athletes come together. That was demonstrated perfectly at the Sports Personality of the Year. The BBC Sports Personality of the Year for 2006 is Zara Phillips. Where Mike's pride for Zara was clear, in the midst of leading figures from the sporting world. I don't know if many boyfriends could be convinced to be at every single event every weekend, but certainly Mike's been able to support Zara through the competitions where the pressure's on, and it really matters. By the time Mike's major games came along in the peak of his career, Zara's horses were turned out in a field for the winter and enjoying their holidays. Mike was now very much part of the royal family. Mike and Zara just seem solid. I think there is obviously a huge amount of love in their relationship. If you watch their body language, they're always smiling, they're very tactile, they're very warm, they seem comfortable in their own skin and they seem comfortable together. Zara's next big goal was to compete in the 2008 Olympics with her horse, Toy Town. How big a deal is the Olympics? Is it the absolute ultimate for you? Toy Town going to cope? Is he well at the moment, actually, and fit? Because obviously he was injured for Athens, wasn't he? So. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's fine at the moment. And, um, uh, yeah, well, he's going, going, going the right way, put it that way. 
Olympics business aside, the world awaited an important announcement. There have been these little rumours about a secret engagement. I'm not seeing a ring, so is there any truth in any of that? I wish you guys would get a new question. <laughs> Come on, it's been in the papers, you're planning a well, secret. Well, it must be true then. <laughs> so, are you denying it completely then? No secret, no, no wedding I'm not plan. engaged, everyone, okay, I'm not engaged. It would take Mike another two years to make his move. We were together for seven years, actually, living together, uh, before he finally popped the question. Got a laid-back fashion, I think. It was just before Christmas. He, they were sitting on the sofa watching a film. For all that Zara likes to be ordinary, <laughs> she's never going to uh, get away from the fact that her granny is the queen and her mum is a princess and her uncle is going to be the next king. Uh, so there are hoops that have to be gone through and formalities that have to take place. And permission had to be given for them to marry because of Zara's position in the royal family. Obviously, that was forthcoming. And it seems that Mike slotted in very well. December 21st, 2010. Just a month after Prince William announced his engagement to long-term partner Kate Middleton, Zara and Mike broke their news. They planned a low-key and private wedding. I think in a way it was a masterstroke deciding to have the wedding up in Edinburgh at Canongate Kirk because it's such a small building. They were able to fly under the radar just a little bit. Both Zara and Mike are just incredibly normal people, I think. It can't really be said enough how easy it is to forget who they are because they fit into both of their worlds and one another's worlds so incredibly easily. They both get on with what they're doing. They both work hard. The couple were keen to keep their married life as down-to-earth as their courtship. So would it be wedded bliss for the party-loving pair? It was much more a rugby piss-up than a sedate royal wedding. Pictures emerged of him with his arms wrapped around a girl. He splashed over some papers.
On the 30th of July, 2011, Zara and Mike tied the knot with a ceremony at the Canongate Kirk on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. The couple were starting their married life together the way they meant to go on. This was to be a private family wedding with the world's media kept firmly outside the modest 17th century church. I think Mike and Zara did themselves a great favour, actually, by getting married uh, just a few months after the big event, which was William and Catherine's wedding. You know, we all had a bit of wedding fever that year, 2011. And so, I suppose, two or three months later, they were able to fly under the radar just a little bit. Obviously, there was some press coverage and there was, there was interest. About 6,000 people gathered outside Canongate Kirk in Edinburgh. But it's not a church that many of us know anything about, and it's nothing like the, the glamour and the decor of Westminster Abbey. The broken-nosed bridegroom got to the church more than an hour early, accompanied by his best man, fellow rugby player Ian Balshaw. Mike arrived chewing gum, actually. <laughs> he got a bit of stick for that, but hey, I know. Bridegroom with fresh breath, nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Um, obviously, there was an incredibly impressive guest list no uh, heads of state, no dignitaries, they didn't need that. Um, but they had the Queen and the Duke there and all the senior members of the royal family. So it was very posh wedding in, in that way. It wasn't a big public occasion. You know, the cameras were not allowed into the church. She turned up looking very beautiful and very, very happy. They had lovely weather, um, but it was very, very low key. Her wedding dress, yes, was, was beautiful and, and glamorous, but it wasn't ostentatious and it wasn't showy, I don't think. I think it was just, it's a special day and, a, and it requires a special dress. So I think it, it was, um, yeah, it was beautiful and it was her. On the day, I think both Zara and Mike Tinder looked at their peak of happiness, which you would expect on your wedding day. But I think the reality with them is that they are a couple very much in love. They, I think she's met her soulmate in him. After the ceremony, the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh stayed at the reception just long enough for a glass of bubbly before returning to Balmoral by helicopter. As the evening progressed, the proceedings became more informal, aided by free-flowing vodka a throwback to the newlyweds wilder times. So Mike and Zara's reception at Holyrood House, which is the royal residence in Edinburgh, very prim and proper, um, was a raucous affair. I think definitely it was the first time a vodka fountain had ever been seen in a royal palace. And it definitely uh, caused some consternation with the men in grey suits. Everyone got absolutely annihilated. Certainly people who left the reception in the early hours from the Palace of Holyrood were very worse for wear. Some of them couldn't walk properly. <laughs> I mean it was very obvious that a good time had been had by all. The booze was free flowing and Mike and Zara had vowed to make it the party to end all parties and it certainly lived up to that billing. But these wild festivities could have been the prelude to the shortest royal marriage ever. Just six weeks after the wedding, the bridegroom was caught on CCTV with old flame Jessica Palmer in a bar in New Zealand after England had beaten Argentina in the Rugby World Cup. The footage was posted on the internet and the story was picked up by newspapers in New Zealand and back home in Britain. In typical Zara form, she just sort of, um, she, she just broached the subject, she found out what was going on. It was in fact an old girlfriend of, of Mike's, Jessica Palmer, and he explained that it was just two mates larking around, you know, a few drinks, uh, having a laugh and a bit of a, a wrap around. Um, and she understood that. She, she rang Jessica, apparently, um, talked it through, and in a very mature way, just put it behind her. She, she probably slapped him on the wrist or something when he got back. But I think it does show the resilience and the, the strength of their relationship. Reports differ as to kind of how Zara reacted, but it didn't seem to dent their relationship. And I think that's one of the reasons their relationship has endured and, and actually strengthened. Because not only did 
Zara believe him and just moved on. She was secure enough to just accept what, what Jessica said, accept what her husband said and move on. Zara soon put Mike's late night antics behind her. Just nine months after hitting the headlines for all the wrong reasons, she did so for the right reasons. She made the British eventing team for the Olympic Games. I think in a lot of ways she probably felt that she was fighting to prove herself again, to prove that she wasn't a flash in the pan who'd come out, done a couple of incredible things and then done nothing since. Zara's greatest success to date, and she may well go on to have other great successes, was in the 2012 uh, Home Olympics, the London Olympics. Uh, she'd been heartbroken to miss both the previous Olympics because of injuries to her horse. But this time, um, she was fit and so was her horse. And th they did very well. She stayed in the village. She enjoyed the whole Olympic experience. And a very exciting time for you, this. Yeah, I'm very happy to be part of it and, you know, hope we can all five of us can do an awesome job. <laughs> she came eighth in the individual, but in the team sport, um, the eventing, uh, they won silver medal. Can you hold them up then? Can we have a look? Yeah, just a Hooray! Cheesy greens. Yay! <laughs> Zara's success in the saddle mirrored Mike's achievements on the rugby field. It was a sure sign that the couple had a lot more to offer each other than people may have first thought. Mike Tindall was a rugby player at the top of his game and by having somebody there to, to, to inspire you, to push you, to support you, to nurture you, that you can bounce ideas from, that can stimulate you, that can make sure that you get up for training, that must have been an advantage in their relationship for both of them. Mike knew what it took to win and I think that really helped Zara, I think it really actually helped her believe in herself as much as anything because she's a very talented sportswoman but, but obviously you have to be able to believe in your head that you can do it to actually then be able to go and achieve it. Zara's mum, Princess Anne, had played a major role in bringing the Olympic Games to London. Of course, she was a famous horsewoman herself and had missed out at the Olympic Games in Montreal. So I think she would have been slightly bittersweet, obviously, that she hadn't managed to win an Olympic medal. But knowing Princess Anne, I think that she would have been, if she'd have had to choose between having an Olympic medal herself or her daughter winning one, she definitely would have wanted her daughter to win one. And of course, she watched her, she watched her win it and she was absolutely delighted. And who pops up to give you your silver medal but, you, but your mum? And so that was a nice family moment. Tell me how that... Felt. Yeah, it was awesome. Obviously, she's part of the IOC, yeah. so... Um. You were expecting it. It wasn't I'm a huge sure surprise. I thought they might do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, it was, it was cool. It was really, um, you know, to get a medal anyway is is amazing. Of course, it was very special for Zara to have her silver medal put round her neck by her own mum, <laughs> who um, shook everyone else's hand, but with Zara. Anne, who is not demonstrative at all, uh, leant forward and gave her daughter a kiss on both cheeks. I mean, a magic moment, both for, for mother and daughter. It's rare for Princess Anne to sort of show emotion publicly, but you could really see on her face just absolutely how proud and delighted she was. Zara's sporting achievement marked a change in the royal, who had shown her potential in her own right and had made people take her seriously. Now the Tyndalls were a force to be reckoned with. They demonstrated how modern royals could function both as individuals and as a couple. Zara and Mike Tyndall are a good example of a modern royal couple. I mean, they're accessible, they're low key, they live their own lives, they make their own decisions. They're not um, part of the royal family in that we don't pay for them. So we, I guess the press and the public have less expectations of them. They can do what they want and we let them get on with it. The thing about Mike and Zara is that they're very practical, very accessible, very tactile. They are the most normal and delightful couple. Um, so I suppose that, that gives you a more human face of royalty, if you like. The pair have always been keen to do their own thing, and that means paying their own way. After Zara's ill-fated hello shoot with her ex-partner, she's been careful to make sure that their means of funding their lifestyles flies under the radar. Their sponsorship deals are carefully crafted to enhance brand Tyndall. Zara is making the most out of being seen as the embodiment of country life.
I think for brands like Land Rover, Rolex, and the clothing brand Musto with which Zara works, she is absolutely manna from heaven because not only is there kind of the royal cachet, but also she's a very kind of quintessential Brit. And that essence of Britishness and what it means to be British and the countryside and the horse riding and the slightly slightly posh, slowly pony, it means that she is marketable around the world. Zara's always been quite savvy with how she's worked with, um, with companies and she does represent quite a unique asset because, of course, she's a very successful rider, she's a beautiful woman and she's a royal. I want a new instructor, please. <laughs> He's rubbish. She's had a long-standing partnership with Land Rover who have a history of supporting eventing. And so she's able to keep the, the boat afloat using sponsorships in much the same way that other riders do. It's, it's a fact of life uh, in the business. There is nobody paying the bills just for somebody riding and winning. Uh, prize money is minimal in our sport um, and so being creative with business partnerships is what pays the bills at the end of the day. As part of her deal with Land Rover, Zara featured in an advert wearing a mud splattered white evening gown and stilettos. She just looked like a supermodel. She was, you know, perfect endorsement. She looked glamorous. She looked aspirational. You know, you can see why she would appeal to so many brands. I thought that was a very clever advert because it, it sums up her appeal. She's not precious, she doesn't stand on ceremony, even when dressed in a ball gown, she doesn't care if she gets it dirty, it's fine, that's what dry cleaners are for. She's as normal as you possibly can be when you're born into one of the most dysfunctional and abnormal families in Britain. I think the fact that Zara's life revolves around an incredibly public facing sport has allowed her to have a sort of duality to her life that would probably be quite hard to achieve for most royals and um, she's i would say a career woman first and a royal second um, she doesn't make a song and dance about the fact that she's a royal and um, at the end of the day what it all comes down to is the work and the horses and the competition. Meanwhile, Mike has appeared on several celebrity TV programs since retiring from the rugby field. He is a patron of three charities and has also turned his hand to after dinner speaking. Mike is his own business. He is the business. As many famous sporting personalities are, um, he can earn a lot of money on the after dinner circuit. Um, obviously not during, during the year we've had with lockdown, but uh, that's a very lucrative source of income for him. He also has endorsements and, and sponsorships. He can be a brand ambassador. Um, so he uses his name and his success as a rugby player. For the Tyndalls, family is everything. They've carved out a role for themselves as confidants and friends. Mike has used his status to support the issues that affect his family, like Parkinson's disease. Spoke to him a couple of years ago for a, for a piece on his. Uh, he was doing a, a charity cycle event uh, across the south of France um, in, in aid of Parkinson's Trust. Obviously, his father's suffering from Parkinson's, um, and and things things like that. He, he was always wanting to to help others. And likewise for Zara, she's made sure that she's there for her cousins, who are constantly in the media spotlight. Although Zara's not a working royal, she's still a senior member really of the royal family and her relationship with the future King William is very close and that closeness was really signified when William made Zara godmother to Prince George. It's a very close relationship. I mean, they're very close in, in age. Uh, they've got an awful lot in common. They've got the same granny. So um, she's very close to her cousins. Despite the pivotal role they play within their families, some of their own decisions have been called into question. Princess Zara would not have been allowed to sell pictures of her firstborn to Hello magazine. And they've been accused of making money out of their royal name.
Life has been good for the Tyndalls. They've made a decent living and settled on the Gatcombe Park estate, close to Zara's mum, Princess Anne. They soon started a family, but eyebrows were raised when the couple sold highly personal photos of the Queen's great-granddaughter, Mia Grace, to the same magazine that upset the royal household last time Zara was featured. The first real pictures we saw of, of Mia were in Hello magazine, which of course they were paid for, um, which did raise some eyebrows because of course it is still the Queen and Prince Philip's great granddaughter. Speaking to journalists, Mike had a logical explanation for going public with the pictures. We did it because people wanted it and we had control over it by, you know, we had, we had those photos done anyway. Um, so it was, it was more because people seemed to want sure. it rather than anything else. Uh, did you have to ask permission from the in-laws or, or, or not really? I'm not going to talk about it. Doing a photo spread in Hello is an absolute no-no for a working member of the royal family. But as daughter of a princess and not a prince, Zara was not born with a royal title. So there was nothing to stop her and Mike selling their baby photos. They took the criticism in their stride and refused to be drawn on it further. Before long, interest in the accusations died down and Zara and Mike adapted well to combining parenthood with their busy careers. But life was about to get more difficult for them both. Even for such a, a happy, successful couple as Mike and Zara, uh, life isn't always smooth sailing. And they had the tragic strong character, just like Mike, and someone who shared her passion for, for sport. And while the pair have proved they are by no means perfect, they've ensured the longevity of the young royals for another chapter. I think they're an incredibly likeable couple. You see them joking around together, very tactile, always um, a hand on his arm or his arm around her. They seem genuinely uh, a lovely couple to, to be around and, and, and really, really good fun.